Hey everyone! Sorry I couldn't be in class today, uh, but I hope this isn't too bad. Who are we kidding? It's gonna be bad. Anyway, uh, hopefully you'll watch, and hopefully uh, you'll get something from it. I did break it into two parts, as I mentioned in class. Uh, the, these are the things we're going to talk about first. In the first part, we're going to talk about what is a group, and define group, what a group is. Then we're going to talk about why groups are important, uh, what, are, what are the benefits of groups. We're going to talk about some characteristics of groups, and then we're going to talk about uh, how groups affect individual performance, and that's all we'll talk about for the first part. Um, so let's get right to it, all right? So, what is a group? A group is three or more people who interact and are interdependent in the sense that their needs and goals cause them to influence each other. That's a group, all right? One thing I forgot to mention is that I also will have sent you an outline that you can follow along. All right? Let's get back to it. That's a group. A group is three or more people who interact and are interdependent in the sense that their needs and goals cause them to influence each other. All right, so that's a group. Now, why are groups important? What benefits do groups give us? One benefit is that they satisfy our need to belong. The idea behind the need to belong is that over the course of history, being in a group provided certain benefits. Specifically, those who were in groups were more likely to survive and face the challenges of their environment, whereas those who weren't in groups weren't as lucky. Uh, they were more likely to fall prey to predators or the weather or what other harsh environmental elements they might be facing. So those who had the desire to form and maintain groups had the benefit. So groups can satisfy that need to belong to groups that uh, we have. Yes, we all vary in how uh, much we need to belong to groups. But we all have some need to belong. Also, groups satisfy our need to feel distinct. Being a student at Texas Tech might satisfy your need to belong. You're a member of a very large group. You could probably go anywhere in Texas do this and people would recognize you as a Red Raider. You might have a fairly easy chance of finding a fellow Red Raider and they might flash this back to you. Uh, don't go to Stillwater, Oklahoma, the home of Oklahoma State University and do this because then they might think you're doing it wrong because in Oklahoma State University, you sport fans, please feel free to correct me. I'm not much of a sports guy, but I'm told that they do this. Um, supposedly they're not very original, but anyway, uh, I heard that from one of my Texas Tech friends, so they go to Grand Swap. Anyway, I don't know what's true. So being a, uh, a student at Texas Tech might satisfy you need to belong, but it's a very large group. It might not necessarily fulfill your need to feel distinct. So you might be attracted to smaller groups, the theater department, um, the anime club, yes, the school has one, uh, or I guess the more common smaller groups would be fraternities or sororities. Um, these smaller groups may help to satisfy that need to feel somewhat, to feel distinct. All right? Groups also help to shape our identity, or they help to define who we are. I come from a low socioeconomic family. We were poor. Right? Now, most of the people I knew were also fairly poor, but 
their families emphasized blue collar work and manual labor. And so for them, that became a valuable achievement. That became a valuable thing to shoot for. Um, whereas my family emphasized education. So my group shaped what I viewed to be a worthwhile pursuit. So I viewed college education as a worthwhile pursuit. Many of my peers raised in families who, as I said, emphasized the color work and manual labor, they didn't view advanced college degrees as, uh, as a worthwhile achievement in the same way that I did. So our groups shaped us differently. And finally, groups offer social norms. They provide social social they provide social norms for us. Alright, so they tell us what's acceptable. We've discussed social norms already in the conformity chapter. So you know what a social norm is. Groups provide that. Alright, so those are the benefits of being in a group. So what are the characteristics of a group? Well, first, they're small. All right, they tend to be about three to six, six three to six members. Uh, big. They can be bigger, but as I said before, they get much, uh, too large, then they start, the chances that every other group member will impact your behavior drop, or at least impact it directly. Um, <clears throat> groups also tend to be homogeneous. Now what that means is that they're all similar. It's a ten dollar word for similar. Alright? All of them, most people in groups are similar to one another. Now that might happen for two reasons. One, groups may only attract people who are already similar to the current group member. And second, once in the group, there might be increasing pressure for all the members of the group to conform to the social norms of the group. All right, so. A, they probably, or one, they probably already started being similar, and B, once in the group, the group probably exerted, probably exerted extra pressure for everyone to be similar. Uh, an example of uh, a group pressure that I've heard of in the past, I once spoke with a member of some fraternity at uh, University of Oklahoma, and he told me that no one in their fraternity wore American Eagle, because I think he said something expected. That is the clothing brand for high school students. I don't know. Um, I may be remembering wrong. I'm not sure. But that is an example of the group increasing pressure for members of the group to conform to some rule. One of the benefits that we mentioned earlier of groups is that they provide social norms. One of the characteristics of groups is that they have social norms. And you recall the mission, the definition of uh, social norms from chapter seven, conformity chapter. All right, so groups provide those social norms. How often does one party? How often does one study? 
Um, how should dating be handled? Um, social norms tend to apply to everyone in the group, but groups also provide social roles. Social norms apply to everyone in the group. Social rules tend to only uh, apply to particular people in the group. So, look at the university group, uh, the Texas Tech group. All right? You have professors and you have students. Students have a different role to play in the Texas Tech group than do professors. All right? But we all have the social norm of doing this after we win a game. Um, or being excited or going for uh, some sort of celebration after we win a football game. That's a social norm. Whereas my role as professor, your role as a student, these are uh, social roles. All right, so they differ in specificity. Social norms apply to everyone in the group. Social roles only apply to the people in the group. Um, we have a schema for each role that we play. So we have role schemas. So if you recall, a schema is every bit of knowledge that you have about a particular topic. So a role schema is every bit of knowledge you have about each of your roles. Uh, your role schema, your, your, your role, your role schema for being a student would include every bit of information you have about what it is to be a student. What you should do, uh, what's expected of you, uh, how you should behave in classes, all of that is included in your role schema. Um, we also have role schemas for gender. We have uh, men and women tend to have certain roles to play in society. Traditionally, the role for women was dependent uh, and supportive of uh, men. And men, on the other hand, their typical or traditional gender role has been assertive. And uh, their role included providing for their families. Now that's starting to change. So whereas women have traditionally been dependent and submissive, and men have traditionally been independent and assertive, women are becoming more independent and be becoming more assertive. It's interesting because I, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with Huey Lewis and the News. They're a band. Um, if you ever saw uh, Back to the Future, they they wrote a lot of songs, or at least two songs for that. The Power of Love is one of their songs. Uh, back Back in Time, they wrote for uh, Back to the Future. Anyway, one of their songs. I'm a big fan of I have their greatest hits, and one of their songs um, mentions explicitly people today, women today feel that they should be free, and that's only right. Those are, those are the lyrics in the, the song. So, women are becoming more independent. Now, they, there have been periods across the course of, over the course of the 20th century, where they have been more or less independent. And what's interesting is that when their personalities were measured, during the times when they were more independent, they also became more assertive. Uh, whereas when they were more dependent, they tended to be more uh, submissive. Um, or at least less assertive. Right? These roles, these social roles, can also be very powerful. Sometimes they can even take over your identity. I've given you, oh, uh, before I forget, I want to mention one last thing on gender role. I have posted or I've emailed you a link to a video really highlighting gender roles. All right. Um, the, it, it's, I think it's called the flip side and it shows men and women, uh, going to the bar scene, uh, and we all know the typical uh, gender roles for men and women at the 
at the bar or club or whatever when you're especially when you're trying to find a mate or I guess a more quickly a way to say it would be uh, find a date. Um, but we all know what men and women typically do in those situations. Uh, the video switches it so women are playing the men's parts and men are playing the women's parts. You don't have to watch it. I just think it's hilarious. Uh, one of you guys gave it to me. You others, uh, everyone else should check it out. It's fun. But anyway, so back to the power of roles. Roles can be overpowering. They can overtake your identity. Um, I've also given you a link, uh, or either posting it or emailing it to you, a link to a documentary over the Stanford Prison Experiment done by a fellow by the name of Zimbardo. It's a very interesting study. Uh, what they did is they recruited people with newspaper ads, college students specifically, um, to participate in a two-week study. Now, they then transformed the basement of the Stanford Psychology Building into a makeshift prison. With the flip of a coin, they then randomly assigned participants to either be a participant, uh, a prison guard or a prisoner. The prison guards were given khaki shirts, khaki pants, and large reflective sunglasses. The prisoners were given these very loose-fitting gowns with a number stamp on them. Now, Zimbardo thought that at the end of the two weeks, the roles would have taken over their identity, but he didn't have to wait that long. Uh, within about six days, things started, well, I believe within the first day, things started getting a little crazy. But they had to stop the experiment after six days. Remember, it was supposed to run for 14. Uh, but after six days, they had to stop it because things were getting out of hand. Zimbardo himself didn't even realize they were getting out of hand because he was involved in it. He was playing the part of the prison's uh, warden. He didn't recognize him as being going along. It took his girlfriend at the time coming in, visiting him, seeing what was happening, and telling him, hey, something's freaking wrong. All right? So he had to cancel her up. But in the situation, what happened was the prison guards were becoming abusive. They would come up with very creative ways to punish the prisoners. The prisoners were becoming uh, submissive. They were becoming uh, uh, exhibiting depressive, depressed, de depression-like symptoms. They were just they were just shut down. Um, except one, I believe, one of the pr the prisoners actually left. Um, but if you watch the documentary. It'll give you more information on that. Again, you'll have to watch it. It's just very interesting. Um, you might be interested in checking that out. Now, when these roles become so powerful, they take over the identity. What can happen, when, especially when you're in a group, is a phenomenon called de-individuation. Now, the individuation is the loosening of the normal constraints on behavior when people cannot be identified. All right. So, in the Stanford prison experiment, Zimbardo kind of helped that along by giving the prison guards um, these large reflective sunglasses covered most of their face, and the prisoners they had no identifiers; they had a number stamped on them, so their identity was kind of he tried, basically, to artificially uh, hide the identity. All right. Now, when groups get violent, the bigger the group, the more violent it gets. All right. Um, now, why do groups? Why can groups get violent? Now, uh, why do people in groups, when they de-individuate, de do atrocious things? Well, there's a loss of accountability. All right, being in a group, especially larger groups, kind of shields you or gives you the illusion of anonymity, the illusion that you are anonymous, that no one will ever be able to identify, excuse me, you. Um, now this not only works in groups, although that's how it's traditionally been studied, recently though, 
it's been uh, seen online. Um, so if you're familiar with trolling, you'll have people who sign up for a profile that can't be, doesn't have their name or picture on it, and then they just go online and post some very cool things in uh, forums, on uh, product reviews, Facebook profiles. They just say some horrible things that people wouldn't say if you were looking at them, or at least most people wouldn't. Again, there's this loss of accountability, so it doesn't only work in groups. So Any time that you can be, you can act without people identifying you, you can get this individuation or this uh, loss of uh, and the and the loss of accountability. The last characteristic of groups that we'll talk about is group cohesiveness. Group cohesiveness refers to the qualities of a group that bind members together and promote liking between the members. All right. So you and some friends, you might have gotten together with some of your friends uh, or met some of your friends and started hanging out with them because you all like a common one of sports. All right. I, I met many of my friends because we were interested in theater um, or game uh, board game so that is a quality that might lead to uh, me and others binding together to form a group all right now when a group is brought together just for those intrinsic reasons and there's no there's not any expectation to perform all right uh, group members are likely to stay in the group or likely to take part in activities uh, Activities with other with the group, and they're likely to try and get other people who are similar to them to join the group. But if a group is brought together because they need to achieve something, football, military, uh, a work group, whatever, when they perform well, They become more cohesive. However, the reverse isn't so simple. All right. When you when the group is having to do activities that require close coordination, like um, football team or um, you know, platoon of, of soldiers. When they're having to uh, cooperate closely, cohesion can lead to better performance. But if cohesion ever becomes the most important thing, if the members Start focusing on well. We, we got we got to stay we got to stay together. We got to stay together. When that becomes the most important thing, performance can drop. Uh, you can get a loss of critical thinking. You can get groupthink, which we'll discuss in book two. Right. So those are the characteristics. All right. So well, that was probably a little frightening. Anyway, we talked about. Uh, what groups are. We've talked about the benefits of groups and we've talked about some of the characteristics of groups. To conclude part one, we're going to talk about how groups affect us individually. Specifically, we're going to talk about how groups uh, influence our performance. Now, how groups influence our performance depends on whether we are being individually evaluated or if we are in a group that's being evaluated. So our group is being evaluated. If we are being individually evaluated. You get social facilitation effects. Now your book defines social facilitation as the tendency for people to do better on simple tasks and worse on complex, complex tasks.
when they are in the presence of others and their individual performance can be evaluated. All right. So the presence of others. can increase our state of arousal. If the task we're performing is either simple or well-practiced, then we perform better. However, if the task that we're performing in front of others is complex or not well practiced, then we perform worse. All right, that's social facilitation. Now, what is causing that increased, what about the presence of others is causing us, causing our state of arousal to go up? There are a couple explanations. One is being in the presence of others makes us more alert. Other people make our environment more unpredictable. Just by, other, just by virtue of other people being there, our environment becomes more unpredictable. There are more variables in that situation's equation, so to speak. All right. This explanation has the benefit of not only explaining why social facilitation works with humans, but also explaining why it works with non-humans, and it does. So your book talks about a, a study where social facilitation was observed in cockroaches. All right. So they gave cockroaches either a complex or a simple maze to get through. All right, and they either put other roaches in clear containers in uh, in the maze so that they could see the participant cockroach. When cockroaches were being seen by other cockroaches, all right, and they had the simple maze, so they had a simple task. Okay. When a light was shown into the maze, they found the dark spot really quick. But when there were other cockroaches there and the maze was complex, shining that light into the maze, uh, it caused the cockroach to try and find the dark spot, but they had a harder time of it when other cockroaches were watching them. All right? So you see social facilitation with uh, non-humans, all right? Another explanation for why the presence of others increases our state of arousal is when we're in the presence of others, we may become apprehensive that we're being evaluated. So evaluation, apprehension. Um, our apprehension that we're being evaluated just makes us, essentially makes us more nervous, increasing our state of arousal. Um, the last potential explanation is that the presence of others distracts us. It divides our attention. Which uh, raises our state of arousal. But according to this explanation, it just doesn't, it, not only the presence of others will lead to social facilitation effects, but any distraction could lead to social facilitation effects. And that's this be the case. Uh, the research uh, confirms that. Alright, so if you're studying, you may not want to do it in the tech library unless you're in there on a slow day. All the other people around you may. The task of studying is not simple, so the other people around you might 
lead you to perform uh, worse. Because, again, study is not the same thing. Alright? So this is what happens, social facilitation is what happens when, when we're in the presence of others. Alright? Or, or uh, sorry, uh, social facilitation happens when we are being evaluated as individuals. What happens when the group that we're in is being evaluated? When that happens, social loafing occurs. And it is basically the exact opposite of social facilitation. Alright? The ten so your book defines social loafing as the ten the tendency for people to relax when they are in the presence of others, and their individual performance cannot be evaluated, such that they do worse on simple tasks but better on complex tasks. Again, that's the exact opposite of social presentation. So, presence of others. When the group that we're in being, is being evaluated, instead of arousal, we get uh, relaxation. So with simple tasks, uh, individual performance drops. The more people you get in the room clapping, the quieter each individual claps. All right. So if you're in a room with five people and you're all trying to, you're all told to try to clap as loud as you can. If you're in a room with five people, you're going to clap louder than you would. If you are in a group or uh, in a room with 15 people, all right. The task is simple. All you're doing is clapping, and the group of the group is being evaluated. The whole group is asked to clap as loud as to clap as loud as you can, all right. Simple task. The group's being evaluated. You uh, so individually, you don't perform as well as you could. However. If the ta task is complex, you perform better. All right. So social loafing occurs when the group you're in is being evaluated, and social facilitation occurs when you, as an individual, are being evaluated. Okay. But I want to emphasize that these endpoints here, worse or better, we're talking about your individual performance. Okay? So with social facilitation, social facilitation, when you are individually being evaluated, it causes increased arousal. On simple or well-practiced tasks, you perform better. On complex or unpracticed tasks, you perform worse. When you are in a group and your group's performance is being evaluated, it causes you to relax. And on simple tasks, you individually perform worse. Uh, but if your group is performing a complex task, you as an individual perform better. Okay? Um, so if you combine the two diagrams that I've put up here, that'll give you the whole uh, kind of layout. Uh, your book also has a diagram, a path diagram that, should, that breaks this whole thing down too. Okay? Now, speaking of social work, do men and women socially loaf equally? No. Actually, the research shows that men socially loaf more. All right? Now, why is that? Are men just lazier? Well, Eagley um, and Wood suggest that the reason women are less likely to socially loaf is because they have that relational interdependence that we discussed back 
when we were discussing the self. They focus on their close relationship. They don't want to let members of their group down. Uh, men may be less concerned with that. So, Eagle and Wood uh, emphasize the relational inter interdependence as being a, uh, as playing a role in women socially loafing to a lower or to a lesser extent. Also, um, people in Eastern cultures tend to socially loaf to a lesser extent than do people in Western cultures. They socially loaf less. People in Eastern cultures socially loaf less than people in Western cultures. All right. Um, now, why might that be? Again, it has to do with their interdependence. Specifically, people in Eastern cultures have an interdependence on control. They focus on the group, the achievement, the um, they they care about the good of the group as a whole. All right. So they're less likely to slack off than are people who are more individually focused or have an uh, independence of control, such as people uh, in Western uh, societies. All right, there we go. We've talked about uh, what group is, we've defined it, we've talked about the benefits of groups, we've talked about some characteristics of a group, um, uh, and we've talked about how groups affect us individually. That's, that's it for part one, all right? Um, Hopefully you're not bored outside your mind. Um, but if you are, go ahead and take that break. Go ahead and take that 10 minute break at least. Uh, that I normally give you. All right. All right. See you for part two.